Welcome back. Last week on our show, we had Dr. Marwa Azeb talk about religiosity and mental health. She's back with us today to continue that conversation. Welcome to the welcome back, uh, Dr. Marwa. Thank you. Now, I want to focus. Uh, you know, one uh, mental illness that we hear about mm -hmm. a lot is mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the biological factors related mm -hmm. to depression? With things like, like depression, some of the studies have shown that there is abnormal uh, blood flow. So, for example, there is increased blood flow, meaning more activation mm -hmm. in areas like the frontal cortex in amygdala and this is the circuitry that's involved in enhanced fear mm -hmm. so it's no wonder that somebody who Makes suffers worse, from depression yeah. uh, might, their fear um, response might be much more exaggerated and it's also explained why many people who suffer from depression also at the same time suffer from an anxiety right which is generalized mm -hmm. fear also you see uh, decreased blood flow which is less activation going to areas that are involved in attention it's not surprising that one of the symptoms of uh, to diagnose depression is inability to concentrate. So it wow. all fits together. Yeah. Also, one of the other uh, things that you see in people who suffer from depression is that they have a thinner uh, right hemisphere. And mm. that when you t test them uh, or do tasks that are related to the right hemisphere, that they don't do as well on, as a result of this thinning cortex um, in the uh, right hemisphere. So does this mean people who are, you know, who have a genetic disposal, for example, to something like depression, mm -hmm. does this mean that there's no hope for them when it comes to, you know, if they start becoming more practicing and engage more in prayers and, and that kind of thing? Saying that something is biologically determined mm -hmm. or that there is predispositions that are genetic or familial or yep. near circuitry doesn't mean necessarily that because of the brain is involved that the treatment has to include medication right mm. or it has to only depend on medication we know for quite a long time now that your experiences change your brain and rewire the brain yeah. and spirituality and religiosity is one of the strongest experience depending on how authentic and sincere someone is with god that a brain can go through mm, right and this certainly has been supported by a lot of the recent research that looked at both religiosity and spirituality and uh, the brain. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, we mentioned earlier that people who suffer from depression, more yep. specifically in the study, they looked at um, MDD or major depressive disorder. And they looked at people who are have a familial risk, meaning that they were children of parents who had severe or mm -hmm. moderate depression, or that's their grandparents who suffered from okay. moderate to severe depression. Mm -hmm. So that's called high risk, okay. right? And they looked at them, but they also looked at people who don't who have low risk or there's no someone no one in their family to their knowledge yeah. that has suffered from uh, depression yeah. and what they saw is that people um, in the high risk group whether they end up developing depression or not had thinning cortex in in that study was 28 oh, wow. percent atrophy or reduction in volume that's that's a big chunk yeah. that rivals disorders like schizophrenia that rivals things like alzheimer's disease so it's serious whether this person goes on to develop depression or not that mm -hmm. has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Now, how does religiosity and spirituality yeah. plays with such a very obvious biological yeah. factor like a reduction of almost one third here yeah. we're talking about. And for someone who has a genetic, who has a familial risk of developing MDD, major depressive episode. Yeah. So here's what a couple of studies have shown such really promising, amazing results that looks exactly at this question. So what they saw was, is that it, overall, mm -hmm. overall, yeah. in people, so looking at people with low risk and high risk, that re, when they uh, measured the religiosity and spirituality, that people who had high religiosity and spirituality, they had one fourth of the risk of developing major oh, depressive wow. episode. Oh, if that's wow, wait till the second part. Mm -hmm. Now, when they focused in on the high risk group. Yeah. So the children of parents or grandparents who had who moderate likely. to severe, yeah. who, def who have this who genetic predisposition. Okay. How, how did their religiosity or spirituality help them versus people who were in this high risk group but did not have high mm -hmm. religiosity and spirituality? Yeah. So their risk went down or was one tenth Oh, of wow. the risk of the other people. In other words, that people in the high risk that did not see religion or did not practice religion and spirituality, they were nine times more wow. that's, likely to develop MDD. That's, that's, a, that's extremely a, powerful. That is very powerful. Yeah. So clearly, you know, religiosity and spirituality has a big role to play in communal mm -hmm. mental health of mm -hmm. our communities. 
what advice do you have for a moss and you know even uh, I actually may, maybe mo mainly moss to support and provide uh, the right programs and activities to help ensure and foster communal mental health so there's two steps yeah okay and one has to come before the other okay we cannot jump into increasing aw awareness and talking about treatment because we're not there yet let's just be honest with ourselves um, the first thing that has to be done is that we have to destigmatize. Mm, okay. So that has to happen first. That we have to just bring these stigmas, be honest with ourselves, myself included, and get these stigmas and throw them really hard on the hard floors of reality of Muslims who commit suicide, right? Yeah. Of the bullying that's happening. Um, I mentioned in the presentation that while I was on my way to give a talk up north, um, the, the uh, person who was taking me was mentioning that they just had a string of seven to eight suicide in our Muslim community, yeah. right? So, and so we need to do that. We need to explain the biological factors and we need to explain that you could be the most religious person, but Allah has chosen to test you with a mental illness yes. that has nothing to do or measures your religiosity. And no one is in a position to measure anyhow, no matter what's going on, yeah. right? So that's step number one. Step number two comes to implementation. After we have got rid of a lot of the bias, yeah. so that somebody can come into Juma prayer, Friday prayer, after the sermon say, and say, hey dude, you know what? My depressive symptoms are acting up this yeah. week. You know, what are you doing after prayer? Let's catch a call, you know, let's have a coffee mm -hmm. or something. And if he or she feels completely comfortable and the person next to him has zero judgment about that and we're at that stage, that's when stage number two begins. Stage number two would, maybe we would come up with manuals or halaqas that are focused on mental illness or mental health. Mm -hmm. So um, what ends up happening is that someone who suffers from a mental illness, they don't want to go to the prayer. Yeah. They don't want to go to the halaqa because they're worried that they're going to say something they're going to be judged for it or they don't want to have a panic attack in public yeah, yeah. and start breathing heavily and then everybody in the halaqa and the small but if we target them we say that this is the exact person that needs to attend the halaqa because they will reap the, they get the most benefits out of the halaqa yeah. right so if we, our halaqas are mentioned or the theme is around that or maybe each halaqa we begin with a verse that has to do with fighting negative thoughts and there's plenty in the quran right and we begin with that halaqa and maybe then you know everybody's mandated or asked to or encouraged to memorize that verse and then implement that verse tailored to the yeah. whatever uh, the mental illness is and then we talk about it the next halqa how did you implement it what worked for you mm -hmm. so let's say we have a halqa concentrated another the scientific name for this is a self-help group yep. okay but why not get tawab while you're at it of right course. there's nothing wrong with doing yes. good business with god right <laughs> so you know have a halqa the main thing for this halqa is going to be an anxiety so then you know if you suffer from an anxiety and we don't have to, we can call it a nicer name so people don't feel stigmatized if we're not there yet. Yeah. But let's say you know, you're, ex you're a perfectionist. People like that because it yeah. sounds successful. Then you know what, we want you in this halaqa. Then you know, the halaqa leader inshallah will look for verses that will deal with that and that, that's going to be implemented. There's homework assignment. So you're getting thawab, you're learning about Islam and at the same time you're dealing with mental health with people that you really trust. Yeah. And then it empowers and yes. helps them, right? So that's in a more, per, you know, a smaller setting. And then I think that every single big conference, Muslim conference, must have a talk, a keynote talk on mental illness. You have audience that's sitting there and you, you know, make sure that the doors are shut and they can't get yeah. out. That's it. You gotta go to the bathroom before yes. you talk. And make sure when you have thousands of captive audience that's sitting there that you're going to talk about this and they're going to listen. Yeah. And words can do magic. You know, words have started wars, right? Yeah. So words can do magic and just spread that awareness. And then every local masjid, if this is important, um, like we blame the masjid, we'll say that, you know what, the mosque is not doing talks on mental health. Yes. You know what, I'm just not gonna go anymore. But why? I'm they don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we're all guilty of that. I just wanna say thank you so much for providing such practical tips. And I hope our viewers and myself included can actually take back and truly make a difference. So yes. thank you so much. No problem. I'm hoping that everybody right now turn off the TV, call their local message and says, hey, we need to see more of this. We need to message. talk. Right? Yes. <laughs> Inshallah. Okay. Thank you so much. This is no problem. Hey, YouTube. We hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.